foreign threats and domestic divisions. An invasion could begin at any time. The likelihood of a Russian invasion of Ukraine increases. Any American in Ukraine should leave as soon as possible. As more American troops are set to deploy to the region. Meanwhile, these documents are the property of the United States, they're the property of the American people. New reporting about former President Trump's handling of top secret and classified documents. Plus, we saw what happened. It was a violent insurrection. The word insurrection is politically charged propaganda. Republicans uh, at odds over how to define the January 6th Capitol attack. The science is saying now that masks work, masks make a difference. And Democrats debate mask mandates. Next. This is Washington Week. Corporate funding is provided by Consumer Cellular. Additional funding is provided by the estate of Arnold Adams. Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson. Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves. Robert and Susan Rosenbaum. The Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Once again, from Washington, Moderator Yamish Alcindor. Good evening and welcome to Washington Week. As of this hour, U.S. officials are now warning that the standoff between Russia and Ukraine is an urgent situation and that President Putin could invade at any time. Russia has been conducting large-scale military exercises on the Ukrainian border. President Biden has said Americans in Ukraine should leave now. He is set to speak to President Putin Saturday. That comes as the Pentagon has ordered 3,000 more American troops to deploy to Poland. And this week, President Biden spoke to NBC News' Lester Holt about the role of troops in the region. What scenarios would you put American troops to rescue and get Americans out? There's not. That's a world war. When Americans and Russians start shooting at one another, we're in a very different world than we've ever been in. Joining me tonight to discuss all of this and more, Margaret Brennan, moderator of Face the Nation and chief foreign affairs correspondent for CBS News. Philip Rucker, deputy national editor for The Washington Post. And Vivian Salama, national security reporter for The Wall Street Journal. Thank you so much, all of you, for being here. Margaret Brennan, I want to start with you first. Obviously, now the region is bracing for a possible invasion of Ukraine by Russia. What changed in the last few hours, the last few days, that really changed the urgency of this situation? And what do you know about, what do we know, really, about President Putin's thinking as it relates to whether or not he'll invade? Yumish, this is an incredibly dangerous moment. This is the largest military buildup uh, that we have seen in about 40 years in this part of the world. And what we know is that uh, something has changed in the past 24 hours in terms of the level of concern among U.S. officials. What we know is that about 80 percent of the military forces that Vladimir Putin would potentially need to use in order to carry out an invasion are now in place. The rest of them could swiftly follow. Uh, what my reporting has uh, borne out uh, over the course of today is that the U.S. Uh, has not assessed that Vladimir Putin has made a final decision to go ahead with an invasion, uh, but there is an increased sense that this window of opportunity to persuade him otherwise is closing, and it's closing quickly. We are coming up on a key period of time where conditions could be ripe for a military invasion or attack of some form to take place. And thus far, Yamish, the diplomacy has not uh, delivered anything uh, that would show Vladimir Putin is using these forces to actually win something at uh, the negotiating table. He is taking maximalist positions, and he is not moving from them. Tomorrow, when President Biden speaks to uh, the Russian president, uh, he will have an opportunity to perhaps persuade him to take an off-ramp. 
And Margaret, you say that the window is closing here for, for officials to really impact President Putin's thinking here. Um, the White House officials have said that Russia, they requested this phone call that's going to be happening on Saturday between the two presidents. Um, what more do we know about whether or not President Putin can be persuaded? Is there anything that President Biden can say to maybe change his mind? Um, and really, is there a sort of diplomacy? Is it, is it a solution that can still happen here? That is what there is certainly a lot of hope among uh, Western diplomats, among U.S. officials. And I, I have to say here, I hear different things depending on which European official I am talking to. Um, and it, there, is some, there are some points of difference there in terms of the uh, perception of Vladimir Putin's intent. Uh, but it is hard to argue with the facts on the ground that he has created in terms of the military buildup. And that is really where these warnings that you're seeing, whether it's Canada, the UK, the Israelis, move their diplomats and thin out their presence in that capital city of Kyiv. Um, and it is that uh, concern that that capital city could be taken with relatively short notice uh, in a very effective way militarily that has caused concern among many of these Western countries to say, we need to hedge our bets and protect our people and move them out of the line of fire. So a uh, potential line of fire. Uh, so for, for President Biden, I don't know what the strategy will be in that phone call. Threats may not be the best tack forward, but certainly that has been the public posturing to date by the Biden administration, that um, there won't be preventative action, that will be deterrence, but there will be punishment uh, in the form of economic sanctions and further buildup of U.S. forces in the NATO countries surrounding Ukraine. Yeah. And Vivian, I should say thank you again for being here. You've been very generous with your time. You're sort of our Ukrainian correspondent at this point with all that's going on. So we really appreciate you coming back on. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about the, the issues on the ground. Um, Margaret was just talking about the fact that the facts on the ground um, tell the story here, apart from whatever the posturing is. We have seen Ukrainian officials, the president of Ukraine, um, trying to downplay the threat that was that was happening here. But then today we saw Ukrainian military forces say, actually, this is going to be a sort of urgent situation. We are worried about this military buildup. What's changed there on the ground? And, and why are we hearing this sort of tone change by Ukrainian officials? Well, they do recognize that the situation is becoming very dire for them, that um, Russian buildup is not actually scaling back, that it is building up, and especially to their northern border in Belarus, where they have this major issue now with a number of troops in Belarus growing by the day, and it doesn't just threaten Ukraine. It also threatens countries like Poland, the Baltic countries, a number of others. And so this is something that they are acknowledging, and they know to deal with the threat. They understand what their country is facing. But one of the big issues, and the reason that they've been trying to tone down their rhetoric the whole time, is to not um, instill panic. For them, um, any kind of hit to the economy, a, a major blow domestically to uh, President Zelensky and to his officials. And they believe that that is something that could really, you know, kind of trigger a house of cards situation where um, if the economy gets hit because people are rushing the banks or fleeing the country, panic, then really a lot of other issues um, could happen and the government could crumble or be very vulnerable. And so that is really what they're trying to project publicly. But privately, they do recognize that their country has been under a threat for eight years. And they probably do recognize, and some of them have acknowledged me privately, yes, we see that the situation is growing increasingly serious, but we just don't want to have to protect that. And part of it is sort of, remember, it's a little bit of a bluffing game into a twofold uh, For them, they believe that uh, Vladimir Putin has been bluffing up until very recently, and they don't want to show that they are in any way intimidated by him or fearful of what he could possibly do. Uh, the Ukrainian military is, a, 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 like, leaps and bounds more powerful, more equipped, more skilled than it was in 2014. And so for them, they, the, the image that they essentially want to put out there is, OK, if you are really going to take this tack, bring it on. We are ready for you. And so that is what they've been trying to project this whole time. Yeah. 
Yeah, and Phil, um, you have, of course, Margaret talking about how dangerous the situation is. You have Vivian talking about the fact that this is incredibly serious. I wonder if you can talk about the politics of this. President Biden campaigned on ending wars. Here now, we're seeing more troops, 3,000 troops, go into uh, the Eastern Europe, and, and they're there to bolster um, NATO allies. Jake Sullivan, who is a national security advisor, insists they're not there to fight. But what are the politics at hand here? What is the president weighing as as all of this is happening? And could it impact Democrats in the midterms? Uh, it, it absolutely could, Yamish. The politics here are very dicey for Biden. This is a war-weary country and has been uh, in the two decades, nearly two decades, uh, since America uh, began those wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Biden, as you note, campaigned in 2020 on ending uh, U.S. entanglements overseas. He, of course, withdrew uh, U.S. forces last year from Afghanistan, uh, bringing an end to that war, the forever war. Uh, and yet that was a chaotic and messy withdrawal. And so there are a couple of things on the line here for Biden. There's, of course, the uh, the question of whether U.S. forces go into Ukraine and actually engage uh, in a war with Russian forces were Russia to invade Ukraine uh, in, in, in protecting uh, our ally, the Ukrainians. But there's also the question of can Biden uh, competently execute a strategy as commander in chief? He got a lot of criticism last year over the withdrawal from Afghanistan. It was messy. It was chaotic. Uh, civilian lives were at stake uh, in that withdrawal. Withdrawal. It took. It was very difficult to get all the Americans out uh, in time before the Taliban took over the big cities and villages in Afghanistan. And so, a lot of people are going to be watching whether Biden and his administration can execute their strategy as it relates to Ukraine uh, cleanly, competently, and without putting American. Uh, military lives in danger. You've seen so far today uh, that Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, is urging Americans to leave Ukraine, uh, that it is dangerous for them there. And so people will be watching in the next couple of days to see how, the, how that is all executed. Yeah. And, and Margaret and think Phil's talking about the danger and people... Oh, go ahead. No, I, I think Phil is right. I think there are two things here. I think Afghanistan looms large in terms of the competency that Phil just pointed to. I mean, that is just absolutely essential. And you hear that, whether it's the National Security Advisor emphasizing time and again, if you're American, leave now because we're not coming in to get you. That is not just about saying we're not going through uh, the unprecedented uh, evacuation in Afghanistan, but that they are also not going to be boxed in or allow the president to be boxed into a situation where he could be forced to confront Russia head on if an American is somehow caught in crossfire or American staff, because remember, we have that U.S. embassy there, even though the staff is thinning out. But I would also say, um, in terms of what President Biden ran on, he also framed his entire presidency as about returning America to the world stage, about redefining who America is and reminding the world uh, about the international rules-based order, which sounds like really wonky foreign policy stuff, but it's everything in terms of uh, just how the world has functioned since World War II. Uh, the idea that might doesn't make right, that you can't go in and just invade a country because you like the territory, uh, that there will be punishment under international law, that there will be consequences for it. And so on the other side of this decision, you have President Biden looking and having to weigh does he want to defend that system and how much? He's already said he's not willing to have American lives cost. He's not willing to send in U.S. troops to defend that world order. Uh, but he has to do something here. Uh, and he has to flex that muscle because on the other side of this potentially is a much riskier world. Uh, because what is the message being sent uh, to China, to other aggressors? And when you have two nuclear powers, the U.S. and Russia, uh, potentially facing off here, um, that puts a real different uh, cast to the decisions here other than just a, you know, a, a conversation about Ukraine. So the stakes here really are high um, for, for the president in, in terms of his entire message as the foreign policy president who spent decades doing this. He was the guy who ran the UK, Ukraine portfolio back in 2014. That also looms large that Vladimir Putin got the better of the Obama administration in that moment back then. He did seize the territory. He didn't back down. And now 
President Biden wants to show that he learned that lesson, that he won't get uh, caught again. And it's all such good context here when you think about the stakes of all of this. Um, Vivian, I want to ask you one last question. There are so many people that are watching this that maybe are connected to people who might be deploying um, or who have loved ones who are in the military. Talk a little bit about sort of what, is, what goes into a decision to deploy our troops. The fact that the U.S. is saying they're not going to fight, but they could possibly maybe be in harm's way. Talk a bit about that and the consequences that could come of this dangerous situation. Of course, for military families, any situation like this one is one that provokes a lot of anxiety and, uh, you know, just a, a lot of emotions. And especially after what we saw in Afghanistan last year, uh, you know, uh, those those emotions are, are definitely on overdrive as well. But uh, President Biden has been very firm all along, and Margaret just touched upon it, that he just has no desire to get involved militarily. And that even includes um, this risk that the capital, Kiev, could be attacked. And a lot of European officials are saying something very different. They say if Kiev is attacked, it's game over. That kind of changes the entire dynamic in the ball game, and they may have to uh, get involved. But the U.S. still staying firm to the fact that they do not want to do it. This is a European issue at the end of the day, and militarily, the U.S. doesn't have a role to play. However, the U.S. troops are still there as a support mechanism. They're there to reinforce um, our allies. They're there to help Americans get out uh, safely. And that is the mission that they are primarily there for at this point in time. Yeah, and an important mission. Thank you so much, um, Vivian, in particular, for sharing your reporting. And I said, for, again, for being so generous with your time. I really appreciate it. Meanwhile, this week on the domestic front, the National Archives asked the Department of Justice to investigate former President Donald Trump's handling of White House documents, including information marked classified and top secret. And over the past few days, Washington has saw both parties divided. The GOP tensions came after the Republican National Committee censured representatives Liz Cheney and Adam Kingsinger for taking part in the January 6th investigation. The resolution called the Capitol attack, the violent Capitol attack, quote, legitimate political discourse. That language immediately led to backlash from Democrats and a few Republicans. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell pushed back as well. It was a violent insurrection for the purpose of trying to prevent the peaceful transfer of power after a legitimately certified election from one administration to the next. In the meantime, a number of Democratic governors announced they would roll back mask requirements. But in his interview with NBC News, President Biden stood by the mandate. Though he would not directly criticize Democratic governors, he did say this. I committed that I would follow the science, the science as put forward by the CDC and the, and the, and the federal people. And uh, I think it's probably premature, but it's, you know, it's, it's a tough call. Joining the conversation now, Aaron Haynes, editor-at-large for The 19th, a nonprofit news site focused on covering gender and politics. Thank you so much, Aaron, for being here. I want to go first to you, Phil. You've written, of course, two books on former President Trump um, and covered him extensively. Talk a little bit about sort of the significance of what we learned this week on how the former president handled documents and also the fact that there are call logs that are missing critical information. Um, could there be consequences here now that we have the DOJ involved? There could be, Yamish. Uh, we'll have to see whether the Justice Department, uh, how, how they decide to move forward uh, with these revelations uh, that some of the documents that were obtained by the National Archives uh, in recent weeks from Mar-a-Lago that Trump had taken with him from the White House, that some of them were classified, including some were top secret. And thanks to the reporting from my colleagues at The Washington Post and some other news organizations, we've learned a lot about really the carelessness with which Trump uh, and those who worked for him in the White House, uh, how they approached the archival process and how they, how they dealt with uh, documentation, presidential records that are part of the public record that are supposed to be sent to the National Archives. How, you know, there were papers that Trump had apparently torn up 
and then uh, aides had to tape them back together. Uh, there was even a report from the New York Times' Maggie Haberman that some documents uh, had been flushed down the toilet uh, by the former president. And so there was a real disregard for the law, the federal law, which requires that these public records be treated as, or that these presidential records, rather, be treated as public records and handed over to the National Archives. We're going to have to wait and see what the Justice Department decides to do about that. But politically speaking, there's a real irony here, because we all remember uh, it was only five or six years ago when Trump began running for president and he seized upon Hillary Clinton, then the Secretary of State, her use of a private email server and, and the classified documents that were sent uh, on private emails and made that a major issue uh, in the 2016 presidential campaign. Fast forward and we see pre former President Trump with yeah. the same careless regard. Yeah. And Aaron, what is it? What does it reveal about sort of where the state of American democracy is that you have a major political party, the Republican Party, um, the Republican National Committee, saying that January 6th was, quote, legitimate political discourse and that there are only a few Republicans willing to speak out against it. And that comes as a new poll, a Pew Research poll, found that fewer Americans are blaming former President Trump for what happened on January 6th. Right, Yamiche, and I think it's important to point out that that, that, that resolution, uh, you know, really criticizing uh, Representative Kinzinger and Representative Cheney, that, that was unanimously approved at the RNC gathering uh, that, that described January 6th as a legitimate political discourse, which uh, could not be further from the truth for those of us who were watching and who were present on the events of that day. Listen, I think overall, the more that we learn in the press about the January 6th insurrection, the stronger the case for public hearings and a full accounting of what happened and how we got there. Democrats know that they're in a race against yeah. the clock on yeah. this issue because midterms are looming, which means that they're competing for voters' attention spans as well as obviously their votes, by the way. Uh, you know, they're saying these hearings could come as soon as the spring and could dominate the midterms headed into November. But if Democrats lose control of Congress, we know what happened, Jimmy. Uh, you know, you can assume the first order of business is going to be to dismantle that commission, which leaves possibly the courts yeah. as potentially yeah. the place where we may learn some, but probably far less uh, about what actually happened leading up to and on that fateful day for our democracy. Yeah, and I also want to ask you briefly about the Supreme Court um, on Monday reinstating a, a Alabama congressional map. Um, the lower, a lower court said that it diluted the power of African American voters. Um, what does it say about sort of the state of the Voting Rights Act, and also what what the power of Black voters in this country, who are critical, of course, the Democratic Party, how that power, that access, also to the ballot box, might be limited um, come the midterms and even the 2024 presidential election. Well, this is exactly why you have local and state officials continuing to press for federal legislation and, and a federal response, really, to uh, the ongoing threat of voter suppression uh, that is functioning under the guise of a false threat to, to election integrity, which we know is not real. We know that the 2020 election was the uh, safest election in U.S. history, according to uh, members of the Trump administration. And so... Uh, the black voters who showed up in record numbers, even in the midst of a pandemic, uh, we know that, that this legislation is targeted directly uh, in response to that record turnout. And, uh, you know, with state houses across the country continuing to pass this legislation, seeking redress uh, in the form of federal legislation, seeking redress uh, in the form of, of uh, Justice Department action, which, by the way, was not really available as an avenue for redress uh, most recently. But certainly with, with Attorney Merrick Garland there now, you have uh, lawmakers, but also uh, so many of the voters that wanted voter protection now uh, looking to the Justice Department take action. Yeah. And Margaret, I want to ask you about, of course, the CDC and the mask mandates. Why are we seeing Democratic governors um, and some vulnerable Democrats who are running for re-election or Democrats who want to be elected um, changing their tune and getting behind li lifting some of these mask requirements? It's fascinating, isn't it? But I think all of us, you know, we know our own exhaustion levels personally. It's something that I know at CBS we have seen in our focus groups. We've heard, regardless of party affiliation, this sense of depression, frustration, exhaustion, and anger, whether it's the state, local, or federal government, that we are in the third year of this pandemic. Uh, and as we know, um, let's be honest, public policy is always a balance in some way of politics 
with the science. It's never clearly one or the other. Uh, at least it hasn't been in this pandemic to date. Uh, there's been a lot of guesswork. When it comes to the masking, I think it's interesting, you know, in November, you had the state of Pennsylvania lift mask mandates. In New Jersey, it will be effective March the 7th. So there is a, a sort of planning ahead going into the spring there that is yeah. different than the way the Republican governor of Virginia instituted his uh, reversal, uh, basically saying, you know, no more mask mandates in a way that locked him into court battles with school districts. The, in New Jersey, for example, the governor is just saying, I'm going to lift it and school districts can decide. So in some ways, it's it's pushing that political problem onto the shoulders of school districts and and schools uh, and, and not having it just be aimed um, at the uh, governor's office here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it, it's something we're definitely going to keep watching. Of course, all of this is happening is inflation is higher than ever. So just all these all these different things that we need to be um, still covering. Thank you so much to Margaret, to Phil, to Aaron for joining us and sharing your reporting. Um, we will continue our conversation on the Washington Week Extra. This week's topics, the fatal shooting of Amir Locke in Minnesota, no-knock warrants, and policing. Find it on our website, Facebook, and YouTube. And tune in Monday to the PBS NewsHour for the latest on the Ukraine crisis as the U.S. and NATO allies seek to prevent an all-out war with Russia. Thank you again for joining us. I'm Yamiche Alcindor. Good night from Washington.